And thank you, Brother Dan. Now's the time. The time is now. Our eminent teacher is approaching the lectern. Brother Ron, welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Thank you, Marty. Good morning. Good morning. Um, earlier this week, I was um, thinking about the woes of God. And um, as I've shared before, when I think of that, the woes, it's a warning. And every time I think about that from the Word of God, it reminds me of Lost in Space with uh, little Will Robinson and his uh, robot there. And warning, Will! And his arms would be flailing around. And pay attention, Will, there's trouble coming. And when I read about the woes of God, that's what comes to mind. And from that, as I was looking at some of these woes, came this message. And I've entitled it, God's Warning of the Abomination of Desolation. But will God, or excuse me, but will men listen? And... Uh, most men will not pay any attention whatsoever. In Matthew, which is where we're going to get started, but Matthew chapters 24 and 25 form what is known as the Olive, uh, Olivet Discourse. So named because of this important pronouncement was given on the Mount of Olives. The discourse is uh, entirely prophetic. It points forward to the tribulation period and the Lord's second coming. It is primarily, but not exclusively, concerns the nation of Israel. Its locale, of course, is Palestine. And it's quite obvious as you read the, the text, for example, let those who were in Judah flee to the mountains. You'll find that in Matthew 24, 16. Its setting is uh, distinctively Jewish. Another example, pray that your flight may not be on the Sabbath. And you find that in Matthew 20, 24, verse 20. The reference to the elect in Matthew 24, 22 should be understood as God's Jewish elect, not, not referring to the elect of the church. The church is gone during this period. But God will still have a remnant on earth. The church is not found in either the prophecies or parables of the discourse, as we will see in a moment. So if you would, please turn to Matthew 24, starting in verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, I find that a little bit almost comical because he's God. <laughs> The temple was built for him. He knows exactly where everything is. But his disciples wanted to be uh, helpful. And it also helps us to understand exactly where this took place. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Look at all of this. Don't you see it? Verily, or most assuredly, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another than not, that shall not be thrown down. Now, from the unsaved Jewish perspective, how could this be? God gave us the temple, and it's God's temple. They were such a privileged people to have the temple of God. The problem was they got to the point where they were worshiping the temple and not the God of the temple. Herod built it too. What's that? Herod built it. Yeah, well, he, 
I think he added on. I think the original building, or part of it, was already there. But they, they got their eyes off from the Messiah. And God would certainly allow it to be destroyed. In fact, he does. It's not just a warning. He does allow it to be destroyed. In Matthew 24, 3, the Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? Now, sadly, there's an awful lot of people that today will ask the same question. They, everybody wants to know about the last days. How is it all going to work out? But you know what? The vast majority of those same people don't want to know anything at all about the God who's in charge of all this. They don't want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. They just want to know how much longer do we have? And how is all this going to end? Hmm. Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed. In other words, pay attention. Stay alert. Uh, take heed that no man deceive you. Why is this so important? The next verse. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now that two words there, shall deceive, is actually one word in the Greek, meaning to cause, to roam from safety, implying being in or on the truth and then leaving that place of safety. In other words, they're talking to people that are seekers of God, perhaps even saved seekers of God. And they went from being safe and secure. Now, I'm not talking about their salvation. I'm talking about their safety in a human perspective to a place that is no longer safe. They walked away. They were deceived. Instead of being fellowship with God, they were deceived and walked away from that fellowship. Verse 6. By the way, it, it doesn't say that uh, some could be deceived. They will be. It's going to happen. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Don't, don't, that word trouble is to be frightened. Um, we are no longer enjoying the rest of God because several have walked away, gotten off course. And there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Now we hear some of this now. But the time is coming during the tribulational period that it will be rampant. There will be wars all over the place. And what does God say about this? For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Nope, not yet. Why? There's going to be seven years of absolute misery. When the church is removed, the Spirit of God is removed. And what is left behind is a world that has no testimony, that has no, the restrainer, the one who was restraining all of this is removed. And if you think it's bad now, <laughs> just wait. It's going to proceed to get worse until it gets really bad.
during the tribulational period. Why? The testimony is gone. The church is gone. The Spirit of God dwelling in the hearts of men, gone. Verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, going to be massive food shortages, and pestilence, meaning plagues, and earthquakes in diverse places, meaning many different places. And it's not just the earthquakes that are in many different places. The famines and the plagues are going to be all over the place, many places. So can you imagine food shortage, <laughs> famines, pestilence, wars, everything is falling apart. God says, relax, I'm in charge. Now remember, this would be to the people that get saved during the tribulational period, the believers then, Mostly to the believers, um, there will be 144,000 in Israel that are saved, plus Gentiles that will get saved. Hmm. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. We're not even into the meat of this thing yet. It's just the beginning of God's judgment. We're not even talking about the last three and a half years yet, the great tribulation. The beginning is going to be no, no day in the park, but the last three are going to be absolutely horrendous, the last three and a half. Verse 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Anti-Semitism is going to run rampant along with uh, hatred for even Gentile believers during that period of time. Anything that is going to remind people of God are going to be hated. The nations will conduct a bitter hate campaign against all who are uh, true to Jesus Christ. Not only will they be tried in religious and civil courts, you can read about that in Mark 13, 9, but many will be martyred because they refuse to recant their faith for their Savior. They're going to be put to death. But Israel as a nation will not be saved yet. Even with this going on, nope, not yet. It's not going to happen yet. Verse 11. So all of this is going on. People are being put to death. People are starving. I mean, it's just, there's wars going on. It, it's just a horrible, horrible time. In the midst of this, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Can you see the, the pressure? The pressure is rising. Things are going horribly bad. And now you have these false prophets that are trying to come up. Oh, they're good. some of them are going to sound so good. They're going to say things mm, that could even deceive the elect, those that are born again. So what is our recourse? You better know this thing. Not us, because it won't be here, but to the new believers that are going to be saved 
during, you better know the word of God and you better rely on it. Then shall many be offended. Hmm. Meaning to entice to sin. That word of offended. People are going to be enticed to sin. To be apostate. And shall betray one another. And shall hate one another. Can you imagine? Just imagine our church family... During that period of time, if we were to be here, and then as we're worshiping together, some within the sanctuary are turning us in. That's what's going to happen. They're going to turn you in. Mm, you, not us, us, all right? Ones that are saved during the tribulational period. I'll read that again. And then sh shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. It's going to cause such a disruption even amongst the believers. Now remember, you got these false prophets that are planted by Satan right in the middle of things, trying to mislead, trying to get people off course. Mm. Verse 11, and many false prophets will, shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, wrongdoing is going to abound in every aspect of life. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I want, to, want you to think for a minute. It's not going to be like it is now with some bad, you know, bad thing happening here or maybe over there and, you know, things, a little bit of troubles that we look at and think, oh, it's so terrible. No, it's not going to be anything at all like that. Everything is going to be in turmoil. People are going to even lose their natural love for one another, turning people in. I mean, it's going to be a mess. But he, verse 13, but he that shall endure in faith in Christ unto the end, the same shall be saved. I want to remind you that not one unbelieving person will make it through these seven years and enter the millennial kingdom. Not going to happen. If it were to happen right now with the world's population that we have now, there would probably be, during this seven-year period, Around 7 billion people die. 7 billion people. You can't dig holes fast enough to fill it with that many people. Rotting flesh everywhere. Disease running rampant. The pestilence. People being sick. And we haven't... <laughs> We haven't even gotten to some of the worst judgments that are coming. Can you imagine this? Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, leading up to the kingdom and what is going to be during the kingdom, that seven years leading up to it, and then the kingdom, and this gospel of the kingdom, this warning shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The end's not here yet, because the Lord in his grace and mercy is still seeking hearts 
And as long as there's hearts that are going to turn to him, God is going to give time. But somewhere along the line, the, the last one to be saved is going to be saved. And then God is going to start the whole thing in motion. He's going to allow it to happen. And the days are going to be absolutely horrendous. Man, if you're going to be saved, do not wait until the trib tribulational period. You need to be saved today as a fact of reality. God is my personal savior. I'm telling you, you're not going to want to live through this. Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso, whoso readeth, let him understand. God is saying, I want you to read this and I want you to understand it. Why? To the whole world. We're supposed to be preaching this. Why? It's a warning. It's a woe. Will Robinson, look out what's coming. At this point, we have come to the middle of the tribulation. How do we know that? Well, if you compare verse 15 with Daniel 9.27, It'll help you with that thought. Daniel predicted that in the middle of the 70th week, that is at the end of three and a half years, an idolatrous image shall be set up in the holy place, i.e. the temple in Jerusalem. All men will be ordered to worship this abominable idol. Failure to comply will be punishable by death. Now, how many people do you think that are really born-again believers, even during that period, are going to bow? It should be zero. But we're going to find out that some will, rather than be put to death. How can that be? By the way, something that came to my mind while I was reading this, what else happens right at this three and a half years into the tribulational period? We studied this, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. The two witnesses are put to death. Up to that three and a half year point, no, no ruler on earth could touch those two men. But at three and a half years, God allows them to be put to death. The whole world goes into celebration and party mode like it was Christmas. And then God, after they are left in the streets to rot. And after three days, God raises them from the dead and brings them to heaven. And the whole world sees them going up. And when that happens... Everything, all the power that God used to keep place, things in place in perspective at that point is gone. Now, at three and a half years, this is when the Antichrist moves in and puts the idol up right in the middle of the temple. He couldn't do it before that, the, when the two uh, witnesses were there. Oh no, couldn't do it then. He, because they could call down fire, meaning, or lightning, same word, and destroy whoever stood against God's temple. So they couldn't do it then, but now these two rascals are gone. And the Antichrist puts up an image right in the middle of it. Now, I've, I've heard others speak on this, and not only will the image be there from what... I've heard in the past, they will actually have pornography on the walls to desecrate God's temple. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, the wicked idol set up in the temple, 
spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand the erection of the idol will be a signal to those who know the word of God that the great tribulation, the second half, is ready to start. When the Antichrist puts that image in God's temple, that's when the second half starts. And the second half is going to make the first half look like a party. Note that the Lord wants one who reads the prophecy to understand it. God says, I've sent you warnings and I want you to understand. But who's paying attention? The unbelieving pay very little attention. Even with all that's going on. Have you ever wondered, like I have, when you see unbelievers and you wonder, how on earth can they not receive Christ with all the difficulties they go through? And yet they still refuse. We're told that the unsaved will shake their fist at God. How dare you, God? It's funny, they don't believe him, but they're going to shake their fist at him. Verse 16 then let them which be in Judah flee to the mountains. Now, if you're like me, <laughs> I couldn't run up a mountain if my life depended on it. In fact, I might even have a hard time running down a mountain. But people are going to flee. Flee for their lives. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. If you're, if you're going to live, you don't want to waste a second once this starts. The world is going to come after you and hunt you down. Don't waste a second. Get going. By the way, when these people... They're going to have to leave. I, I'm working on the house stop. I get down and I go, okay? I, man, I'm running for all I'm worth. How much do you think I'm taking with me? Nothing. You know what's going to have to happen? Those people are going to have to trust God just like the apostles did when God sent them out with nothing. Not a spare pair of shoes, not an extra shirt, not nothing, and God provided. And the same thing is going to happen here. Don't you take any, if you take something, you're going to have to carry it and they're going to get you. But oh no, if you run and you're willing to leave everything of this world behind, I will provide. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. No, don't do it. You won't make it. And woe unto them that are with child. Warning to those that are with child. And to them that give suck in those days. You're not going to be able to run fast enough to escape. Is it possible you could? Yes, but the, it's one more thing you're going to have to overcome. Like I said, I couldn't run up a mountain to start with, and I certainly couldn't do it carrying a baby. By the way, that, that word mountain in a couple of uh, verses back could also picture nations, not nece necessarily a mountain. I'm not saying it does, I'm just saying it can. So if it's not running up the mountains, they're being spread to different nations. Verse 20, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Man, you don't need anything else to hinder you at all. 
For then shall be what? Great tribulation in verse 21. Speaking of the second three and a half year period. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever will be. There's, you can't compare that three and a half years to anything the world has ever seen. Every judgment that comes is worse than the one before it. Man's sin is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And it's allowed to go. The restrainer is moved. But as men's sin gets worse and worse and worse, God's judgment gets worse and worse and worse. Verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Man, God says, if I was to allow it one day longer, not even the redeemed ones would make it out of this. It's going to be so horrible. But God knows exactly how long. There should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Otherwise, there'd be nobody left to, to move forward into the millennial period. Only believers will enter. Verse 23, I got to hurry, I'm running out of time. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Oh, Jesus came and he's in Philadelphia. No. God says, no. If it's a Jesus, it's not the Son of God, Jesus. It's a different Jesus. All right, verse... Uh, no, I, I'm trying to cut, but thank you. 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. We've already looked at that a little bit and show great signs and wonders in the middle of all this, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect, God's redeemed ones. Behold, I have told you before, I've warned you ahead of time, God says. Wherefore, if they should say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. That won't be the Son of God. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. No, don't believe it. I, I love this view. In, starting in verse 27. For as light, the lightning cometh out of the east. And by the way, like I mentioned earlier, that's the same word as fire. And as for lightning coming out of the east and shineth even unto the west. So so shall also the sum, son, also the coming of the Son of Man be. Oh, what a what a tremendous visual sight this will be. Can you imagine? They're in wars, there's no food. How much electricity do you think there's gonna be after a massive war like this? Chances are zero. It's gonna be very dark fall out everywhere, dead bodies everywhere, and everything is dark. And then all of a sudden, out of, the wit, out of the east, a bright light, like the world has never seen before, and lights up the sky from the east to the west, the return of Jesus Christ. The whole world is going to see him when he comes. You're not going to need anybody to tell you, oh, he's in Philadelphia or he's in Jerusalem. No. Every eye is going to see him when he comes. There'll be no having to travel to go figure out if it's him or not. Every eye will see him. Mm. 
Mm, all right, uh, let's see. Verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, dead bodies everywhere, there will be eagles be gathered together, flesh eaters. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, when the judgment is coming, is, has ended, on the last day of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Boy, by the time you get to the end, there's nothing left. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, then shall, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Why? Because if they're unsaved, this is their last breath. There is no more time. God has given them every opportunity. The tribes of earth shall mourn and they shall see. They shall see with their own eyes. What? The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. From one end of heaven to the other. And in closing, even so come, Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but boy, I'm looking forward to it. I don't want to be here during the tribulation. I can guarantee you that. But oh, Lord, come and get us now. Let, let this whole thing start in motion. I'm ready. So let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy to us. Lord, help us to be faithful to you until you call us home. Lord God, speak to our hearts even today. Encourage us, Lord. Even when it looks like everything is falling apart, our God, the stage is being set for your return. So our Lord, we thank you for that. Be with our pastor in the hour to come. May the Lord Jesus be uplifted. In Christ's name, amen.